for Bible school. I'm getting excited. Said my imagination starting to roll. I'm thinking, does anybody have one of those projectors that projects the stars or whatever on the houses? Well, the one that's on the outs, you know, like Christmas time. The, I'm thinking if it can go all white, that would be great because it's all stars this year. It's all about galactic surveyors. So anyway, start thinking stars and telescopes and I don't know what all else we're going to be needing for, looks like some glow in the dark kind of stuff. So it's going to be fun. All right. If you'll get a hymnal, we'll start this morning's service by singing page 136. Good to have you all here with us this morning. Sorry, I got distracted. Page 136, are you washed in the blood? I can't quite say that right. Is it washed or washed? <laughs> 136. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's okay. I'm still thinking washed, washed. I'm going to have to watch as I say it now. Of course, I, I, I wash my teeth. I don't brush my teeth. So... <laughs> you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as I wanted to show that video because, you know, we, we pack our Operation Christmas Child boxes every year, but we, and we send them off from here, but we don't see what happens to them after that. But uh, basically, I mean, it's a huge operation that happens uh, when we do this. Uh, it goes to a, a big shipment facility. Uh, they, they sort through the boxes. Uh, I got an email this year. All, all, the, the boxes from our church this year went to Angola. Uh, I don't even know where Angola is, but uh, I saw a little video. Maybe I'll show it some other time of uh, kids, in, uh, kids actually in Angola op opening these boxes. You can just see how happy they were to receive these things. But uh, I, I think, Tina, tell me, do you remember how many boxes we sent off this year? I don't remember how many we sent, but from the Vandalia church that we take them to was over 2,900, almost 3,000. Yeah. I thought we had 21. Something like that. And I think I, I brought three more after that. So about 24 from our church and then about uh, three... Almost 3,000 from our region. So that's pretty cool. Just from our region right here, almost 3,000 of those gifts went out. Uh, 
So when, we, when you multiply that about so many regions, so many cities all over, over the world, uh, we're, we're blessing a lot of kids uh, with the gospel and with a, a gift in the name of Jesus. So I just want to thank you for your generosity, your, your uh, involvement in that, uh, in that um, ministry, and uh, look forward to next year doing that again, okay? Uh, that's a really good ministry. Hey, uh, a couple things I want to point out. Um, uh, the, we have a, tonight we have our January birthdays and anniversaries, um, uh, and I believe, uh, Le, do you know, does Leroy, is, is he prepared to do a cake for tonight? I think he's, you got it? Okay, Rhonda says that that's taken care of. So we have a cake. Anybody want to bring some ice cream? Ice cream for tonight? Cake and ice cream? Sarah's got the ice cream. All right, so we got cake and ice cream. Come back tonight. Uh, we always have, it's not only the birthdays and anniversaries, but it's also our time for small group discussion. So I'll have a couple small group discussion, discussion questions. So we have discipleship in that as well. So come back tonight at 6.30 for that as well, okay? And I think that's all that I really want to announce right now. Um, so let's pray, and we will continue worshiping together. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your love, uh, for your grace. Thank you for this church where we can worship you together. Uh, we, we pray for those who uh, couldn't make it for one reason or another. We pray that you would bless them, let them know that uh, we love them and miss them, and help us to, to let them know that as well, um, that they are, are, are missed here. And uh, we pray for those who are sick, whether our family, whether our friends. Um, pray that you'd bring them back to good health so that they might return to us soon. And uh, God, we pray that as we worship you this morning, that you would change our hearts, transform us um, through song and through your word and by your spirit, that we might be more glorifying to you. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, it's time for our offertory. If you'll get a hymnal and turn to page 135. I'll ask you to stand with me as we sing Nothing But the Blood, page 135. Have the ushers come on the last verse. Trevor sits back there so anxious and waiting. I was trying to kind of give him the eye that it was time to come, but you were waiting patiently, weren't you, Trevor? <laughs> it is time. <laughs> Ed, will you step to the mic and bless the offering for us this morning? Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day and 
Thank you for the chance to be in your house this morning um, to worship you and to worship with our brothers and sisters. We also thank you for this time that we can give back to you a portion of what you've given to us. Pray that you would use this offering, multiply it here throughout our community and throughout our uh, through our church and throughout our community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
O oh Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be ridden in the earth. For they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. Jeremiah 17, 13, 14.
Father, thank you so much that we have that hope, that we know that we will be with you for all eternity. And um, even now as we worship you, God, help us to um, keep that in mind, always living uh, as it, uh, for eternity and not for today. Um, remembering that for all eternity we will worship you. So even now, I pray that we would worship you with all of our heart. In Jesus' name.
God, we know that you, uh, you made us, you created us. Uh, we are made for your purpose, and all we are is yours, and yet so often we hold back from that. So often we hold on to our sin, and yet we long for that day when um, we come home to be with you so that every breath we breathe is worship to you. Every thought we think is completely worship to you. And we thank you that through Jesus Christ, we have that sure hope um, and that even now, uh, we are washed in the blood through faith by grace. And um, as we worship, as we grow, God, help us to uh, make that more and more of our life's cry to be yours completely. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, when I was a kid, I, uh, I liked to take a magnifying glass outside on a sunny day, and uh, you know it's to follow, right? <laughs> I think all, every boy at least has done this. I'm sure many girls have as well. But we, we would take our magnifying glass and see what all we could burn <laughs> with that magnifying glass, right? I mean, I'd start with things like paper and leaves and grass, but uh, I, then I tried one day, stupidly, I tried my own hand. Don't do that. <laughs> but I, I only made that mistake once and never again because that hurts. Um, but probably my favorite thing to, to burn with a magnifying glass was ants. I like to burn ants. And, and I felt kind of bad about it. Um, you know, these ants weren't hurting me at all. Uh, what, what did those ants ever do against me? But, but I couldn't help it. It was, it was fun. It was fun. It was fun to play God. I kind of think that we like to play God in other ways, too. Um, for example, it's God's role to create and end life. And yet science has advanced to the point that it is now biologically possible to clone human life, essentially creating life. And, and our laws in our country make it legal to take life, whether uh, through abortion or in several states through uh, assisted suicide now, uh, ending that precious life that God has created. Through scientific advancement and, and through what many people call social progress, we have this attitude that because we have the power to do it, we can do whatever we want. We can play God. Well, as a kid, I, I, I played God by burning ants. And I think a lot of people think God is like that. They think that God likes to punish us, whether because of our sin or, or maybe just for fun, because he has the power to do so, because he has all power and he can do whatever he wants. And it's true that God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. And it's true that God hates sin. And all sin will be punished. But I hope you know that God is also love. God said this in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. As I live, declares the sovereign Lord, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his way and live. See, God is, God is serious about sin. But he's also serious about forgiveness. And his desire is that all the wicked which is all of us, right, would repent and be forgiven. So let's pray. Father, we know that we have all practiced wickedness, and we deserve death. 
Help us to truly repent, turning from all our sin, and live. In Jesus' name, amen. Exactly one year ago today, um, I was by myself in a cabin on a lake, uh, on Lake Salatiska, and I was there for two weeks. Uh, the first week, I simply read through the Bible. Uh, it, it took me eight days, reading approximately 10 to 12 hours per day, uh, to read through the Bible, or, or breaking that down, that was about 150 chapters per day, about 4,000 verses of Scripture each day for eight days. It was truly, I mean truly, an amazing experience to read through the Bible that way. I mean, it gave me a, a whole view of God's Scripture, a, a really a whole view of the whole story of all of history, because that's what the Bible tells us. In, in a very short time, I was able to read and, and see the whole picture. And seeing it that way taught me a few things about God and His plan. One of those things is the main point of this sermon today, that God is gravely serious about sin. And very serious, even maybe even more serious about forgiveness. You know, we, we tend to like the second half of that statement, don't we? That God is serious about forgiveness. We like talking about God's forgiveness, but we don't like so much talking about sin. I mean, sin is its something that we don't like to think about all the much. It, 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 in fact, it seems like most of the world tries to just ignore the concept of sin. Maybe even most of the church tries to ignore sin because we like our own way. We like to treat that uh, treat morality as this flexible thing in which we can decide what's right and wrong. We have the right to decide what it is that God wants us to do. Like, like what's right for one person isn't necessarily right for another person. What's wrong for another person could be right for another person. And we like to dwell instead, or instead of all this stuff about sin, we like to dwell on God's forgiveness. We don't like to be reminded, though, that God actually makes the rules that, that, and that God takes our sin very seriously. But if God is so very serious about sin... Why does he allow it at all? I mean, if God created everything, and he, he could have done whatever he wanted, and if he hates sin so much, why create a world in which there's any sin at all? Luke chapter six, uh, 17 now. Luke chapter 17, starting in verse 1. And he, Jesus, said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come. Now stop there for a few minutes. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> Isn't it true that like, no matter where you go, it feels like there's temptation to sin all around us? It seems like temptations are just everywhere. And, and like, when you have a good intention to do something good, like read your Bible or, or pray or start the day off on the right foot like that, it just seems like there's always a temptation. Like maybe your favorite TV program just came on or... Um, you, you think about all the different things you need to do that day. You just want to get started on those things instead. Or maybe when you decide to work on your anger and your spouse comes home in a bad mood. Or, or like the very first day of your new diet, you open the freezer and you see a freezer full of ice cream. Temptation! Right? No matter what we do, it seems like there's temptation all around us. Literally, Jesus said that it's impossible for temptations not to come. It's impossible for temptations not to come. In other words, we can be absolutely positive that there will be temptations bombarding us all of the time. That being the case, why are we often so shocked when we have to face a difficult temptation? I mean, shouldn't we just expect it? We should. Instead, I mean, shouldn't we expect that We'll have to face temptation, not just once in a while, but, but all the time. And, and if we expect them, maybe even anticipating certain kinds of temptations, which we know we're going to be facing, uh, and those temptations that are going to be especially enticing to us, can't we better prepare for our temptations that we're going to face? That's why the day before I start a new diet, I always eat all the ice cream in the house. I'm trying to eliminate the temptation for tomorrow. 
right? Okay, maybe, maybe that's not the best way to go about that. Um, but you see what I mean. Temptations are sure to come, so be prepared. Like, like men, if you know you're going to be home, for a, home alone for a few hours, plan to get busy so that you're not tempted to look at porn. I know men struggle with that. And, and tell your spouse what it is that you plan to get done before she gets home so that you're held accountable. And women, when you know you're going to be getting together with a group who likes to gossip, think ahead of time about safe topics so that when that conversation tends towards gossip, you're ready, you're prepared. Because you know that temptation is coming. So that you can change the subject rather than joining in. And teens, when you know, I mean, we often know that you're going to be tempted to find your worth in things like likes and, and comments and shares on your picture, on your selfie. So, I mean, rather than, so teens, rather than posting that selfie, maybe, maybe pray first and say, God, help me to know that I'm, my worth is in you, God. Help me to remember that, that God is the one who makes you beautiful. Or, or, or Matthew, in your case, God is the one who makes you a manly dude, all right? All right? The thing is, we're tempted all of us are tempted in various ways. Be prepared for those temptations. Temptations are sure to come, so be prepared. But actually, that's not even the point that Jesus was making here. Read on. Jesus said, temptations are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Woe, Jesus! Jesus! Aren't you being a little harsh here? I mean, isn't Jesus all about forgiveness? And what exactly is Jesus telling us to do here? I mean, is he telling us to commit mass suicide? I mean, because I'm sure we've all at some point in our lives been a bad example to others, maybe even to children. And, and then if a little child followed our bad example, then we've therefore tempted them and maybe even caused them to sin. I mean, I mean is Jesus telling us to commit mass suicide here? Or maybe, maybe Jesus is proposing mass genocide so that we're like the kind of, uh, a kind of morality police, always, always looking around and, and seeing, uh, looking out for people who are condoning sin or, or people who just encourage sin, especially in children. And if we see that happen, then we, then we take them to the nearest bridge, tie them up and throw them overboard, right? Is that what Jesus is telling us to do? And if so, where's the nearest bridge? Because I think I need to tie some of you guys up right now and take you over there. Throw you overboard. Or maybe, maybe we all need to go and, and just jump over ourselves. Well, it kind of seems like if we did either of those things, we'd be playing judge, jury, and executioner. We'd be playing God. Or maybe it's even darker than that. Maybe Jesus isn't suggesting we kill ourselves or kill others, but rather that it would be better if we did. Like, the reality is that those who tempt others will suffer much worse than being drowned in the sea. I mean, it kind of sounds like Jesus is saying that anyone who causes a child to sin deserves hell as their destination. Well, at the very least... Jesus is clear that we should never treat sin as if it's no big deal. Man, sin is a big deal. And tempting others to sin, whether intentionally or not, I, that's a big deal. Because you definitely don't want to be guilty of accidentally causing someone else to sin, and therefore you yourself deserving hell. We might at this point try to shift the blame, though. That's what we usually do, right? I mean... Can I really be to blame for someone else's sin? I mean, each one sins because of their own sinful desires, right? I mean, Scripture even says that. James chapter 1, verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then, when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So it's true. Each one sins because of his own desires, his own sinful desires. So each one will have to answer for his own sin. 
And so I can't blame anyone else for my sin. But you know what's also a sin? Tempting others to sin. So not only will you have to answer for the sins that you commit, uh, you'll also have to answer for, the, for your sin and tempting others to sin, whether intentionally or not. When we treat sin as if it's no big deal, we're sending the message to everyone around us that God is not ultimately the judge. But God is the judge. So woe to the one who tempts and therefore causes one of these little ones to sin. But who are these little ones? You know, we often understand that, that term, little ones, mentioned in verse 2, to be children. And, and Jesus seems to make that point in another place, Matthew chapter 18. But even then, I'm not sure that Jesus was talking just about children. Uh, if you look at that passage, in that passage, Jesus uses a child as an illustration. He says this, Whoever humbles himself like this child, so he brought a child over him, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, like this child. Did you catch that? Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. It's like this child. Did you catch that? And whoever causes one of these little ones who are like this child to sin, it would be better for them to have a millstone or fastened around his neck and be drawn in the sea. I think it's clear in Matthew that the little ones who, are, who humbled himself is like a little child. He's not talking just about children. He's talking about those who have faith like a child. You see, our passage this morning in Luke is once again in the context of a dinner party at a Pharisee's house, and, and Jesus keeps on coming back to his point that it's not those who exalt themselves who are great, but those who are humble. It's not the rich who will inherit the kingdom of God, but the poor. Those who are poor in spirit, they're the ones who are going to be great in the kingdom of God. So once again, Jesus is criticizing the Pharisees for their treatment of the poor. But this time, Jesus is saying that the Pharisees tempt the poor to sin. And just how do they do that? Well, I think it's the same way many churches tempt people to sin. Now, what, you might be thinking, well, what are you talking about, Pastor Chris? Church is about places where we don't want to sin. Places where we, you say, oh, you, you don't lie in church. <laughs> this, is the, this, is, this is God's house. This is, this is where we don't lie. This is where we put on our best behavior, and this is where we're good. But here's the thing. Churches are notorious for telling people what they must do. Right? Come to church. Read your Bible. Pray more. Give more. Do more. But that's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is not about what you should do, but about what Jesus has done for you. Whenever we take our eyes off of what Jesus has done for us, we drift towards legalism, just like the Pharisees. Of course, I'm not saying that we should stop doing good things. <laughs> Come to church, read the Bible, pray more, do these things, right? Right? I'm not saying we should stop doing good things, but rather that we should rest in Jesus and then do all these things for him in joy. Not because we feel like we have to, but because God has changed our hearts so that we want to serve him. But then it's not so much that we're doing the good things as if we were good, but rather that the Holy Spirit who lives in us is doing them for, through us for God's glory. It's, it's not so much that we're playing God because God alone is good. It's that God is in us doing his will through us. Verse 3. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. In other words, if you see your brother or sister in Christ sin, don't treat it as if it's no big deal. That's what we like to do. We like to say, oh, that they're, uh, they have to answer between them, them and God. And that's true. They, they will have to answer for their sin. But we also have this great responsibility, even a privilege, to lovingly confront them. You know, we often shy away from doing that because we don't want to come across as judgmental or, or legalistic. And that is a danger. But when something your brother or sister is doing 
is clearly sin, not, not just against your opinion, not just against your preference, when something is clearly dishonoring to God, then you have the responsibility to rebuke them. But what does that rebuke look like? We often think of a rebuke as angry faces and yelling all the time. That's a rebuke. I rebuke thee. No. Or, or we think of a, a hellfire brimstone preacher condemning every sin and warning people that if you do such things, you deserve death and hell. And you know what? There's a place for that. God has used that. But when the Bible talks about rebuking a brother in Christ, it describes it this way. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Gentleness. Humility. Not out of anger, out of love. I mean, that's what God does for us, right? The Bible says that it's, it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. So when we confront someone over their sin, it, the goal is always, always to be restoration so that they might repent and enjoy the forgiveness of God. If you ever find yourself wanting to confront somebody's sin just to prove them wrong, don't do it. Don't do it. If you can't act in love, that's not the kind of rebuke that God wants you to, to, to approach somebody with. Jesus seems to be saying that we should take forgiveness so seriously that we just liberally give it out at every opportunity. End of verse 3, it says, And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. But why should we, Jesus? I mean, there are a lot of hurtful people out there doing a lot of sinful things. And we're just supposed to forgive them when they say they repent? And what if they don't even mean it? What if they, what if they say they repent, but, but keep on hurting me? I mean, God, how can, I, how can you expect me to forgive them? I mean, I can't do that. That's asking too much, Jesus. And yet Jesus died for us. And, and I don't know a single person who has truly turned from all sin. Yet he forgives us. Not because we're perfect, but by grace through faith because of his love. And then he asks us to forgive just like he's forgiven us. I mean, it's, it's fun to play God when it comes to killing ants, right? Right? But, but not so fun when it comes to forgiving others. He actually tells us, be like me. Play God in this way. Forgive. But we like to hold on to our grudges. Our anger. Our condemnation of others. But Jesus said it like this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 15. If you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So is our forgiveness conditional whether we forgive others? Well, no. God forgives us unconditionally. We don't have to earn it. We, we don't have to jump through hoops, but, but when we repent, which just means a change of mind that shows itself through a change of action, when we repent, trusting in God's grace, we repent of our sin of unforgiveness. And, and we begin to want to forgive others just as we've been forgiven. So when someone sins against you, hurts you, even severely, be quick to forgive. And even if he, sin, he keeps on sinning against you, keeps on hurting you, if he says, hey, I repent, would you, would you forgive me? I'm sorry. It, it, Jesus says, you must forgive him. Don't hold on to that anger. Even if he just says he repents. Do you catch that? If he says, I repent seven times, notice Jesus didn't say, and make sure he really means it. You see, when someone offends us and says they're sorry, 
we like to pick up our magnifying glass again and say, I'm making sure you really mean it. We, we like to judge them and make sure that they're serious. We like to play God when it comes to unforgiveness. But the thing is, we're not God. We can't read minds. And to withhold forgiveness when someone asks for forgiveness would be to play God. And, and yeah, it's hard to forgive. So we'll need to lean on the Holy Spirit in us to do that through us because God loves to forgive sinners. Man, we're all proof of that. So lean on him. And when we ask God for forgiveness, he knows if we really mean it. But he also doesn't wait to see if we really mean it. Like, like we have to do a good, enough good works or something first before we are forgiven. No, he's quick to forgive. And it's not because sin isn't serious. It is. But Christ's death on the cross was serious business. So even though God hates sin, and pre precisely because God hates sin, uh, Jesus died for our sin, taking our penalty, so that we have forgiveness through him. So you see, because man so often plays God, God came down and played man so that we could be saved in him. Jesus took the punishment for our sins so that we could be saved in him. And make no mistake, all sin will be punished. And Jesus took the punishment for every sin so that everyone who trusts in him will be forgiven. But the cost was so high. Je Jesus had to give his life. The payment for our sin cost the Son of God. Why didn't God just create a world in which there was no sin? Why did God do that? Well, if you read the rest of the story, you find that that's exactly what God is creating. In Revelation 21, verse 5, God says, Behold, I am making all things new. He's making you new. He's making it so that your heart doesn't desire unforgiveness. He, he's making it so that you always rejoice in good and never in evil. He's making a new heaven and a new earth, and there will be no more sin, no more pain, and everyone will always rejoice in Christ, not because we never sinned, but because all our sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus. See, God took sin very seriously. Jesus died. And God takes forgiveness very seriously. Everyone who trusts in Jesus will be forgiven. So the only question is this. Have you trusted in God's grace to forgive you? Listen, God takes forgiveness very seriously. When you repent of sin, which means that you have a change of mind uh, to, to agree with God that you've sinned against him, and you turn to Jesus believing that he alone can forgive you, then you're forgiven. Nothing else, uh, there's nothing else you must do. You, you don't have to jump through hoops and do enough good things. You don't have to worry that maybe you didn't do it right. God is quick to forgive because he loves you. And when you finally see just how much he loves you, it will completely change your life. You'll want to do good. You'll want to forgive others. You'll want to tell the whole world about his grace and forgiveness. But it starts in you. When you lay down your magnifying glass, stop playing God, and simply trust in Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for taking our sin so seriously that you died for every single one so that by faith in you we are forgiven. Help us to believe so much that we um, begin to love others as well, that we love to forgive others just as you've forgiven us. Transform us by your love. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. Um, if you need to know Christ as Savior, come and, and uh, I'll pray with you. I'll introduce you to Jesus, um, either now or after the service. Right now, let's sing. When I hear the Savior.
Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper's spots melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it pray will be dismissed. God, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you that uh, Jesus gave his blood for us um, because our sin deserved death. And yet Jesus took the punishment for us. He paid for our sin completely because you are so uh, serious about forgiveness. Help us to rest in Jesus, never resting in our sin, never resting in ourselves, but resting in Jesus who gave his life for us and help us to live in him. Uh, rejoice in him um, now every day pouring itself into eternity so that for all and forever and ever we rejoice in Christ and uh, do that do that in us now uh, and this week and bring us back safely uh, so that we might rejoice in you together again in Jesus name amen